Our next speaker is Felix, who's going to talk about RISC-V cryptography extensions. Take it away, Felix. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, so my name is Felix, and I'm going to talk about, as he said, RISC-V instructions and extensions for cryptography. And I want to talk about both research and standardization. So my goal is that you take a bit away from both worlds, so to say. But we will see that they are very closely entangled. So I want to start with a quick timeline here, namely with the adoption, uh, with the standardization of secure hashing algorithms. So if you don't know what that, I, I'm guessing most people know what it is. If you don't know, it's just a very important building block that we need for a lot of cryptographic algorithms. And way back when, in 1995, the first iteration of a secure hashing algorithm was standardized. That was even before I was born, just FYI. Um, then, a couple of years later, we had the second one, because in 2005, we already had security doubts about the first one. Um, so that's also why it was deprecated in 2011. And the newest iteration, um, SHA-3, arrived in 2014. And in 2016, very interesting, we had the first practical attacks for a secure hashing algorithm for, uh, for the first one. And also kind of relevant, um, here in 2018, we had this, this thing called, or since then, we have this thing called post-quantum cryptography. So another term from the cryptographic world, that's about cryptographic schemes that will hopefully remain secure if we had quantum computers. And almost all of those use SHA-3 internally. And now jumping into the future, by the year of 2030, um, this, uh, the usage of SHA-1 should be finally phased out. Ideally, you stop using it well before that. And now I want to interleave this timeline with a second timeline or two major events. So here in, I think, 2013, Intel announced that its processors now support SHA-1 and SHA-2 instructions, and only next year Intel will complete the support for SHA-2. So what do I want to say with this timeline? It's not that Intel builds bad processors or makes bad cryptographic choices, because SHA-2 is still a decent algorithm. But still, I personally would find it nicer if people were not encouraged to use SHA-1 anymore, and also if there were support for, for SHA-3, because we're going to need it for this thing called post-quantum cryptography. So I think it's fair to say that he in this, at least in this instance, the adoption of cryptography into processors evolved slower than the cryptography itself. So um, to put this into a context here, I have a little comic that I like um, that should say cryptography is not everything, right? Like, Computers are there for other things than encrypting and decrypting. Um, but still, it would be nice if we could have, all of us could have a discussion how cryptography ends up in processes. And I guess it's no surprise to anyone here that with RISC-V we can have this discussion. So, a few notes about me. I'm a research associate at the Fraunhofer Institute, obviously interested in cryptography and hardware, but I'm not a member of the RISC-V Cryptography Extensions Task Group, so I have more of an outsider's um, perspective on that. So now that I hopefully motivated you, some, some notes on my agenda. I want to start with standardization, even though my talk is entitled From Research to Standardization, but we will see that the two work hand in hand and very closely together. So we already have ratified extensions in RISC-V for scalar cryptography, and those include um, very basic extensions for bit manipulations, a bit more advanced carryless multiplications, and then um, extensions for complete dedicated algorithms like AES and SHA-2, and also interesting um, extensions for data-independent execution, something that we need for cryptography. And those were, uh, those were reviewed and ratified in 2021. So you might now ask, like, okay, but how were these built? Why were they built a certain way? Do I want to use them or not? And as I said, like with um, Risk Five, um, it's always been very closely entangled with research, and the standardization committee has always tried to be very open about their decision and get as much feedback as they can. And so they also wrote a very nice paper on AES instruction set extensions, which I will use in the following 
to show you how something like this looks in a processor. And for this, we first need to know roughly how AES looks. So AES is just your standard symmetric um, encryption algorithm. And it's based on a round function. And in this round function, we have um, these four steps here, byte substitution, shifting of rows, where we shift the bytes row-wise, we mix the columns, and we add a round key. And um, this was um, integrated into processors with a so-called t-table-based approach. So there you only need to understand the rough idea, which is that we merge all of these four operations here into ideally one big operation. And for 32-bit architectures, that was done by having a byte-wise round instruction. So we select from a register one byte here and then put it through all these four steps. And then the second, um, second operand here is the round key. Uh, for 64-bit architectures, it was done a bit differently, but we can ignore this for now because I rather want to tell you what happens if you integrate this into a processor, and obviously it means your processor gets bigger, but as I would say, not by a lot. So there was this benchmark done here, and they were, they measured an overhead of a bit more than 1,000 gate equivalences. And for, for this cost, AES gets a lot faster um, than if you were to implement it with a standard RISC-V integer instruction set. And um, the memory footprint is obviously even more impacted because you merge a lot of instructions that you needed before into dedicated cryptography ins, um, extensions. So the um, extension task group is also concerned with extensions for vector cryptography. Um, there they are planning to do similar algorithms for, as for scalar cryptography, so basic bit manipulations, but also algorithms like AES. Um, but only not for like scalars, but elements of scalars, which then have a group width of 128 or 256 bits. And there the public review ended just three weeks ago, so we can expect those to be ratified sometime in the near future. So now we've seen like what's already there, and now I want to talk about some things that might make it into the standard someday, or they might not, but still be interesting. And um, here I want to start with lightweight cryptography. So lightweight cryptography, as the name says, is meant for constraint devices, short messages, and the easy adoption of countermeasures as, lightweight, as these devices were, for which lightweight cryptography um, is built are usually quite accessible. So it's basically for everything Internet of Things like, right? Um, and there, there was a standardization procedure that ended just this year in February, and as a winner, the ASCON algorithm emerged. And there was actually a very similar evaluation done for this algorithm, how we can um, integrate it. And here I want to show an interesting aspect, like how yeah, the design of uh, cryptographic algorithms impact, impacts the design of hardware. And for that, we also need to go very quickly um, about ASCON and how it works. Um, but the nice thing with ASCON is that it's built to be very simple, at least on an operational level. So with ASCON, we only have like one substitution layer where we substitute five bits here and one permutation layer where we permute a 64-bit lane here. And you might notice like, okay, but we don't have any round key as we have for AES. How is that? It's because ASCON is a so-called sponge function um, which always has the same operations, but it then absorbs like first a key, then plain text or cipher text to encrypt, decrypt, and so on. But on an implementation level, we always have these operations. And um, well, the authors of some works discovered that actually this S-Box can be implemented quite nicely with the bit manipulations extensions that we already have. And so the only thing left to do is to provide decent acceleration for this permutation layer, which they did with two 32-bit permutation instructions for the low and high half world here, at least for 32-bit architectures. So as I said, like we might wonder now, like how does this impact our processors? Do they get simpler because we use lightweight cryptography? And I would say, yes, they do, because um, with ASCON, we have two additional instructions Whereas for AES, we have up to nine. So I didn't really show that, but with AES, we have um, 
this round function, which differs for the all rounds but the last. So we have there two different operations. We have a key schedule and so on. So for AS, you can have up to nine instructions, whereas for ASCON, two suffice. Um, the hardware is a bit smaller if you use ASCON, um, but then um, AES is still a bit faster, which might be surprising, but then again, like lightweight cryptography is not necessarily about speed. And when it comes to a memory footprint, um, ASCON is still better because of the, the simple underlying structure. So now we have heard, I think, quite a bit about like the normal design of cryptographic extensions. Now I want to go into a few case studies that could be interesting. So far, all extensions that we've seen were drafted from this requirement here, that an extension should favor simple building blocks, instructions with at most two source registers and one destination register. It kind of makes sense since we have a risk, so a reduced instruction set. Um, but what if we choose to ignore this on purpose? And there were some authors who um, said, okay, ASCON has a 320-bit state, so we just take 10 general purpose registers and hardwire them to our ASCON unit here. And what happens if you build it this way? Well, you get a complete parallel ASCON permutation with one simple ASCON instruction. It's obviously going to be a lot bigger than what we've seen so far, like more than 4,000 gate equivalences, but then also a lot faster, like factor 50 faster. For AES and ASCON, we had, for the normal extensions, we had factor 3.5. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So I'll speed it up. So um, um, we might now ask ourselves, like, is this worth it building this way? And I would argue like something like this will probably never make it into a standard. But um, if ASCON is like a very serious bottleneck, people might still decide to build it this way. And with RISC-V or other open instruction sets, you could argue um, it's very nice that we have that and we can do it this way. So last case study, um, this is concerned with um, physical attack countermeasures, and I will keep it short here. Um, what is a physical attack? For example, a side channel attack where we measure secret information from a power um, consumption of a chip. And there the masking countermeasure has seen a lot of attention research-wise and a countermeasure to that, uh, and that's a countermeasure, and it needs a lot of random data. So some people decided to just embed random number generators directly into the pipeline. So you have that available every time you want. And there is also a requirement that might contradict that, that you must not introduce special purpose architectural state. But then again, like people could choose to ignore this. If a standard ever will, I don't know, but it's interesting that it's out there. So to conclude, I think that RISC-V already has some well thought out extensions, but there's also still a huge potential and we have these new algorithms, both on the symmetric side and the asymmetric side of cryptography, which we haven't discussed at all. And then again, I should also mention that coprocessors are sometimes a more um, interesting solution than instructions extensions. Okay, thank you for your interest, and feel free to check out our work on this topic. Thanks, Felix. Um, I'm going to ask sort of a bit of a naive and, um, uh, yeah, definitely naive question. Why in the case of like AES and maybe in the, the newer one you mentioned, um, would you even want to do it on a processor? I mean, the hardware to implement it is simple. Like what's the benefit of having it available in software? Uh, fair question. So as I said, like a coprocessor can have a lot of benefits. For example, that here the last point that you can shield your cryptographic secrets sent from a CPU, doesn't need to know them. Um, I'd still argue that if you have like vector um, processors, it definitely makes sense to not, um, that you don't have to like um, put all the data into a coprocessor, start it, read back all the data, because like AES has a 128-bit state. So, I mean, that's a vector register, essentially. Yeah. So there is an F definitely for um, smaller microprocessors, I think it's mostly a cost size, uh, cost, cost argument if you want to do it or not. Indeed, yeah, fair enough, cool.
Uh, cool. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Comment. Um, so I just came back from chess yesterday, and nice. there was actually a presentation, and they implemented all lightweight cryptography algorithms, including ASCON on uh, the Rocket Core. And there was a very nice evaluation. The, the instruction set extensions. OK. So nice. you, you, should, you can check that. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, I will. Cool. Um, all right. I guess we'll leave it there. Thanks, Felix. Cheers, Thanks. Mate.